The way these briefings work, if you haven't been to one before, is that I'll introduce all of the speakers, they will give their presentations in turn, and then we'll do the questions and answers at the very end. Okay? All right, well, I'm not going to say a whole lot about the subject because we have uh, a lot of material to get through, but I will just say that I find it uh, one of the more fascinating and intriguing aspects of astronomy that just like in biology, we keep discovering new species, uh, new members of the astrophysical zoo. And today we're going to be talking about one of the newest phenomena to be uh, discovered in astronomy recently, which is fast radio bursts. Before I get into the details of who's speaking and what they're going to say, I want to point out that uh, this briefing took a lot of preparation because it involves not just the presenters and their institutions, but it involves two journals. One of those journals is Nature. And as you probably know, Nature has a very strict embargo policy. Now they uh, took great pains to get one of the papers that's being published about this result into print today. Uh, but they couldn't get it into print before 12 noon central time. So that's our embargo. So if you're here, I ask you to, or if you're watching on the webcast, I ask you not to tweet any content from the briefing. You can tweet, you know, who's presenting and you can say, oh, they're presenting exciting things and all of that. But this briefing is under embargo until 12 noon central time, one o'clock Eastern. Um, if you can't handle that, the door's right there, <laughs> all right? We know where you live. So uh, I want to thank the staff at Nature, and particularly Leslie Sage, for uh, making it possible to have the, this paper uh, in, in print this week uh, so that the scientists could give their talks uh, throughout the week and interact with journalists and not feel like they have to clam up. Um, there's also some companion papers being published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, uh, which I'm happy to say is published by the AAS. All right, with that out of the way, let me introduce our speakers. They're going to go from left to right. We're going to start with Shami Chatterjee from Cornell University. He's going to talk about FRB 121102, an acronym that you will have memorized in a few minutes, a repeating fast radio burst. Then Casey Law from the University of California at Berkeley will pick up with precision localization of FRB 121102 with the very large array. He'll be followed by Jason Hessels from Astron in the Netherlands zooming in on FRB 121102 with the European VLBI network and Arecibo. Then Sriharsh Tendulkar from McGill University in Canada will speak on the redshift of the host of FRB 121102 from Gemini Observations. And finally, Sarah Burke Spolauer, I hope I got that close, from National Radio Astronomy Observatory will speak on FRB 121102, what we now know and what we need to find out next. And I'm excited about this. This is uh, certainly the, I think, the biggest astronomical news since the detection of gravitational waves. So let's get on with it. Turn it over to Shami. So hi, I'm Shami Chatterjee. I'm going to be laying out a little bit of setting the stage and laying out the background for where we are and what we're going to be telling you about today. Um, before I start, along with the speakers on stage that Rick just introduced, there's a whole number of team members who are in the audience at the AAS. So I've put their names up here. They include um, Matt Abruzzo, who's our undergraduate student, as well as Robert Wharton, our graduate student. And there's a whole number of people here. So please feel free to look them up and talk to them as well. OK. so. Uh, FRB 121102, it's named after the date of its initial detection, 2012, November 2nd, uh, a repeating fast radio burst. So first of all, what are fast radio bursts? These are millisecond flashes of radio waves. And they arrive, they are dispersed, which is a technical term, which means that they arrive earlier at higher frequencies, later at lower frequencies, as you see here on screen. The first example of these, this is uh, FRB 010724, uh, the so-called Lorimer burst. And you can see on the Lorimer burst that I've shown on the screen, there's a little yellow arrow at the bottom which indicates how much of that frequency sweep could be due to our galaxy. And then the red arrow below, next to that shows how much of the sweep is not explained by material in our galaxy and so has to be contributed either by the host galaxy or by the intergalactic medium or by some combination of the two. 
So this basically indicates that these events are coming from outside our galaxy, and they were known to be one-off events. They were not known to repeat. Um, why do we care about that? First of all, radio telescopes have a very small view of the sky. And so the fact that today we know about 20 of these sources means that the all sky rate, there's about five to 10,000 of these flashes going off every day all over the sky. Every day all over the sky, five to 10,000 of these bursts. What could produce such bursts? Is there extreme physics involved? Right now, there are more models than we have detected bursts. Um, this, is, this is a great situation for us to be in. Um, and then, if indeed these things are crossing the void between the galaxies, they can actually tell us something about the intergalactic medium that they're traversing. There's also various niggling mysteries about this. For example, where are the nearby sources like this if you're detecting distant ones? There's all sorts of fun puzzles that are opened up um, for this field. So FRB 121102 in particular, it's interesting because we found out in 2016, Laura Spittler, and the rest of us co-authors reported that it's a repeating source. So you can see some um, eight examples of these bursts. You can see that they vary in how bright they are. Um, and in this case, I've taken out the frequency sweep so that they're stacked vertically for the known frequency sweep that we do expect. Right? At one stroke, this discovery rules out all of those explosive or cataclysmic models for fast radio bursts, because we know that whatever it is that produced it has to have survived to produce the successive flashes. Right? These are very sporadic, very random, not predictable when they're going to come, but they do repeat. So that's very interesting. But where is it on the sky? I'm showing you a map of this, a VLA map of the sky in red, and on it, the two white circles indicate where, with Arecibo, we have detected the fast radio burst. And you can see that within those circles, there's dozens of radio sources, and there's hundreds of optical galaxies within those circles. So we don't know where exactly the fast radio burst is coming from. But we do know that it's a good place to go fishing because if we can identify the host galaxy or the counterpart at the radio wavelengths for this source, we would be in business. We could start talking more about the physics. And I'll tell you right now, one of the sources in there, inside those white circles, is the counterpart to our fast radio burst. You can't tell which one. That's, that's sort of the point. So here, what are we reporting today? We are reporting that we have, in fact, localized it. And Casey will tell you that we have imaged the bursts themselves directly with the VLA. And we have pinpointed where they are on the sky with a fraction of an arc second resolution. It corresponds to one of those steady sources. Um, there is a persistent variable radio source at the position that we are measuring the burst to be coming from. We know that they are coincident to within 10 milli arc seconds. This is something that Arecibo and the European VLBI network have discovered for us. They have imaged the burst, and we have found that they coincide to within 10 or 15 milli arc seconds. We don't yet understand what the source of those bursts, what that persistent source actually is. Even more exciting with Gemini observations, we have found a little optical smudge that coincides with the position that the bursts are coming from. And that turns out to be a dwarf galaxy, um, which is at a red shift because we have measured its spectrum and we can tell from the Doppler shift of the spectral lines how far away that galaxy is. We know that it is at a red shift of 0.2, which means that the bursts are coming from two and a half billion light years away. So they've been traversing through space for two and a half billion years before they come and are detectable at our radio telescopes. And with that as background, I'll hand over to Casey to tell you about the VLA observations. Okay, thank you, Shami. So I'd like to tell you a bit about uh, how the Very Large Array contributed to this discovery, uh, and so some of the technical challenges that, that, went behind, that came uh, to meet that challenge, <laughs> to meet that discovery, and also what that means for our understanding of FRBs in this case. So um, for context, Arecibo contributed this, this remarkable discovery of the FRB itself. Uh, but we then now have a, a real fundamental problem of where is the FRB in this, air, in this, roughly, uh, uh, this rough area that the Arecibo can localize the source to on the sky. So for representative scale, the Hubble deep field is shown here. This is a, you know, a, a very iconic image of the sky, uh, the deep sky, optically. And just for representation, you can see there's a lot of stuff happening in here. Uh, and Arecibo tells us it's somewhere in an area of this, of this rough size, 
but uh, it could be any host galaxy, or it could even be a star in our own galaxy, for all we know, at the time of this, uh, uh, this discovery. Um, and so what we really need to do is to localize that factor of 100 better or so. So if you think about Arecibo, it's one of the largest telescopes in the world of its size. We'd like something that's 100 times larger. That's how we get that localization. Uh, you can't really do that with a fixed uh, dish, you know, a single telescope. So we use this technique called interferometry to synthesize a larger telescope. And that's what the VLA does for us. This is a representative circle showing the scale, for scale the VLA localization in comparison. So you can see quite clearly if we can do this, capture this burst with the VLA, we can very clearly associate it with a specific host galaxy or star and answer a huge number of questions uh, about the nature of the source and the context for the, those bursts being generated. So the reason that uh, that's hard is that uh, radio interferometers generate a lot more data, right? So if you have, uh, in the case of the VLA, 27 antennas, it turns out that there are 351 pairs of antennas. So these are each kind of independent data streams. It's a, it's a lot more data than a, than, a, than a single data stream that might, that might come out of, say, Arecibo. In, uh, and so uh, we'd like to take that interferometer, that imaging capability, and scale it up by a factor of 100. So instead of having a single data stream, it's many data streams. And instead of being uh, the, 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 the normal interferometric cadence of, a, say, one image per second, we want to go up to 200 images per second. So that's the capability that we fundamentally worked on qu for quite a while with the VLA, with tremendous support from the NRAO and the VLA staff. So a factor of 100 faster means a factor of 100 more data. So that's the first technical challenge. Can we actually write that data down? And the second challenge is finding the needle in that terabyte haystack. So that data stream is a terabyte of data per hour. And we need to find this faint uh, 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 radio burst at an unknown time, an unknown shape in that data volume. And so there's a quite a bit of algorithmic, algorithmic work to capture that faint burst uh, in that large data stream. So uh, with uh, significant work, uh, and this collaboration to target the, the, this particular fast radio burst, the repeater, we finally, after significant effort and coordination, we captured our first radio burst with the VLA on the 23rd of August in 2016. And now I've transitioned to an image of that five millisecond snapshot of the sky with the VLA. And those circles are the circles that Shami showed earlier, the rough area we knew Arecibo told us where the burst should be. And sure enough, right in that, the center of those two images, consistent with the previous work, is the radio burst itself. And so with that precise localization, a whole host of science and uh, 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 follow-up observing is, is supported. So there's a huge number of things that now can be tackled with that precision localization and unambiguous associations. So uh, centering a bit that image, uh, as Shami showed earlier, those two circles, and that box shows you precisely, in, in the middle there, shows you precisely in the deep radio image what is at the location of that radio burst. And what we see is quite clearly there's a radio, persistent radio source there. It's faint, uh, but there is something clearly there that's very closely associated with our precision VLA local localization of the radio bursts themselves. And at that same location is that blue inset is the optical image. So with this initial analysis we had uh, from, from, from Gemini, we knew that there was a, a radio source there uh, and an optical source at the same location. And, with, and the, the FRB was extremely generous to us. So in this one month campaign, we found nine bursts with the VLA. And that was really a surprise for us. Not only were there nine, but they were, some of them were extremely bright. We struggled for quite a while to get our sensitivity uh, you know, down and capture the, the faintest burst we could. And then suddenly this FRB just was incredibly generous and produced nine very, very powerful radio bursts for us. That itself allowed us to do some little, uh, you know, factor of 10 better localization precision than we expected. And so the radio bursts are quite precisely associated with that radio and optical counterpart. Uh, so with that, I will hand off to Jason to talk about what that means for the source itself. Great, great. So uh, picking up from what Casey was saying about the VLA, so the VLA was able to localize the, the origin of the, the radio burst to 100 milli arc seconds, so a, a tenth of a, an arc second. Um, but we wanted to zoom in even farther because it turns out that a tenth of an arc second is still not enough to really figure out uh, everything that's going on physically with uh, the source. So we did this by using a combination of radio telescopes. So first off, let me motivate uh, a little bit better why we would want to zoom in even further. As Casey told you, there's an optical source there, which we thought was uh, you know, the host galaxy of this, this FRB, and Treeharsh will talk about it in more detail. But there's also this persistent radio source. So there's a continuous radio signal um, 
fairly close to uh, where the, the origin of the bursts are. But what we wanted to know was, was it at exactly the same position as the radio burst? Because the size of the galaxy on the sky is less than an arc second, and localization to 100 milli arc seconds, you, you're not too sure where it is in the galaxy. So we wanted to zoom in even further to figure out whether the source of the radio burst had a physical relationship with this radio persistent radio source or whether this was just coincidence. And we wanted to figure out where the bursts were coming from in the galaxy. Were they coming from the center of the galaxy? Were they coming from the outskirts of the galaxy? This is what we wanted to figure out. So we did this using the, the European VLBI network, which is a, uh, a network of radio telescopes spread across the globe. These are connected by high-speed uh, fiber networks, so the data actually streams in real time to a central computing system, a correlator in Dwingelo in the Netherlands. And Dwingelo is a little village in the Netherlands. It's actually probably literally smaller than this convention center. And, uh, <laughs> and all, of these, all of these radio telescope signals all come to this, this one place where they're combined in real time. And you should be thinking about you know, tens of gigabytes of data all streaming into a single, single place at the same time. And obviously, because these telescopes are spread very far across the globe, just like the VLA can provide a higher localization than Arecibo because the telescopes are spread uh, geographically, here we have an even larger spread. Um, and it was critical to use Arecibo and the VLBI network because Arecibo provides the raw collecting power. These bursts are extremely weak. We get beautiful detections with the VLA and with Arecibo, but with much smaller telescopes, they're basically invisible. Um, and combining them together, we get this kind of angular resolution that we need. In fact, the angular resolution is comparable to holding a tennis ball and viewing that across the Atlantic. These are kind of the angular scales that we're talking about here. So what we figured out, um, on the left-hand side is, uh, is an image of the persistent radio source. It's shown at two different frequencies, the, the kind of ellipses, those uh, contours are showing you how the source looks like at 1.4 gigahertz or 20 centimeter uh, wavelength of radio, and the color is showing it at 5 gigahertz. That's the persistent radio source, and these X's are the locations in which we detected bursts. And we were lucky here as well. Uh, the, the source, as Casey was saying, was very generous to us. We were able to detect uh, four bursts in a time span of a couple hours. And those bursts are shown, uh, given the different telescope pairs on the right-hand side here. Obviously, when you pair Arecibo with the largest European telescope, Effelsberg, you get a very strong signal. With uh, some of the smaller telescope pairs, you get a weak weaker signal. But we were able to detect the bursts on all of these different baselines or telescope pairs. And we were able to show, actually, that the, the bursts are coming from a, a distance of less than 40 parsecs, so about 100 light years or so, at a distance of 2.5 billion light years. So this tells us that um, the bursts have a physical relationship with this radio source. This is very diagnostic. It's very important for understanding the physical nature because it could suggest that what we're seeing is that these bursts are coming from a source that's embedded in a dense nebula. That could be what this persistent radio source is. Or alternatively, uh, it could still be possible that we're seeing the signature of some kind of a greeting black hole, something like an active galactic nucleus. Now, leading into Sriharsh's uh, Shri talk about the optical work, we're also able to combine this precision radio localization with the optical localization, and we're able to find that the, the position of the burst and the position of this persistent radio source, which could be a nebula or a, an accreting black hole, is offset from the optical center of this galaxy by about uh, 0.2 arc seconds, so 200 <coughs> milli arc seconds or so. So this is a very significant offset. In fact, it's about a quarter to a half the size of that entire galaxy that uh, that these uh, these two uh, positions are offset by. And we'll be able to study the you know the physical meaning of this in more detail with upcoming Hubble Space Telescope observations. And with that, I'll uh, pass off to Sriharsh, who will tell you more about the optical work. Thank you, Jason. So. I'm going to tell you about our Gemini observations and how we measured the distance to this galaxy, how we understood the properties of this galaxy, and I'll speculate a little bit about what makes this galaxy special. It is ra rather unremarkable if you just look at it in the image. Uh, I should mention that the Gemini Observatory has been very generous with their time, and we are very grateful for their flexibility in, ob in these observations. And I would also like to specially mention my colleague, Case Basa, who's not here at this conference, but he shared a lot of the work on this uh, project. So as Shami, Casey, and uh, Jason have mentioned, as soon as we got the VLA localization, we knew that there was some faint optical object there. But really, if you look at the inset over there, it doesn't look any different from any of the hundreds of other point sources there. Is it? So, it is, it is not clear what it is right from the image. Is it a faint star in our own galaxy? Is it a tiny galaxy which is really far away? 
To figure that out, you really need an optical spectrum. So this is basically you're splitting light into its different colors. And that gives us the identification, the characterization of the object, and possibly its distance via redshift. But this object is really faint. It's a 25th magnitude object, which means that it is nearly a 100 million times fainter than the faintest star which you can see with your naked eye. So you need a lot of observing time on a big telescope. This here, I'm showing the spectrum of, uh, the, of the galaxy. On the y-axis is the intensity of light plotted as a function of wavelength on the x-axis. The wavelength is basically the colors. The shorter wavelengths are the bluer colors. The longer wavelengths are the redder colors. So the dark blue graph which is plotted is the host galaxy. You can ignore the other two for now. So there are two things to take away from the spectrum. First, you, you notice that most of the light from the host galaxy is emitted at very specific wavelengths. These are called bright emission lines. And you can, these are signatures of hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur, which you are seeing here. And what this implies is that the galaxy is forming stars at a rather high rate. The other thing to notice is that there is very little light being emitted between these bright emission lines. And that faint continuum, which is contributed by the stars, indicates that there are very few stars which are already present in the galaxy. This means that this galaxy is a star-forming dwarf galaxy. It is incredibly tidy. I'll, show, I'll point out how sh small it is in a moment. The other thing we, know, we can measure is the redshift, or the, di or the distance in the universe. So this hydrogen alpha line, for example, was emitted at 6,500 angstroms, which is shown by the dashed blue line. And we observe it at 7,800 angstroms, which is a redshift of about 0.2. And from that, we can calculate the distance in the universe. So what did we find? Firstly, this FRB is definitely cosmological. It is not a star in our own galaxy. It is not even just outside our galaxy. It is very, very far away. To be precise, it is 750 million parsec, or 2.4 billion light years away. So the bursts which are emitted were emitted 2.4 billion years ago, and we are seeing them right now, which I think is, imp I find it mind blowing. So the second thing to notice is that this galaxy is really tiny. So in the inset on the right, I'm showing the Milky Way if it was placed at the same distance as this galaxy. Right? And you can clearly see that it's a, it would be a massive galaxy. You would see structure in it. But what the host galaxy itself is really tiny. We are barely able to uh, di distinguish it from a, from a star. So this host galaxy has a 1,000 times less fewer stars than the Milky Way, our galaxy. And it is at least 10 times smaller in size. That's weird, isn't it? Because if you expected that you know, FRBs come from neutron stars or pulsars, you would, expect that, you would expect to find FRBs where there are more stars. So more stars means more neutron stars. So you would more likely find FRBs in large, massive galaxies. So what is special about these dwarf galaxies? Well, one of the things, this is the speculation part, one of the things that makes dwarf galaxies special, including this particular dwarf galaxy, is that it has lower metallicity, which means the gas uh, which forms stars is purer and is able to form more massive stars. There are also two other types of extreme events which are associated specifically with dwarf galaxies, which are long duration gamma ray bursts and superluminous supernovae. Uh, there, it might be a hint that they are somehow related, but right now it's a single data point, so we must proceed with caution. It's only a speculation. We need to figure out whether other FRBs are also localized in dwarf galaxies and whether the repeating FRB is uh, representative of its population. So we need more follow-up, we need more localizations. And for that, Sarah will tell us about our future plans. Hello, um, I'm Sarah brooks -Pullower. I've been working on this project for the last few years at National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and now I'm located at West Virginia University. Um, and I get to tell you the story of now, what, we have, what have we learned from this fast radio burst, and what, what's really next in this field, and for this burst in particular. Now, over the past decade, fast radio bursts have caught the attention as a, of the public and of astronomers alike as a really wonderful new astronomical mystery. Um, and as Rick said, new, new mysteries in astronomy um, are, are somewhat rare, something that's truly, truly not understood, um, does not come along every day. 
And this detection really has broken up, broken open the gates of a new realm of science and, um, and discovery using fast radio burst as tools to explore the universe. And that's, that's what I'll press on today. So first, what do we know from this fast radio burst? Since we now have the first proven distance, we're able to see for the first time just how remote and how bright the bursts from the source must be. And to give an example, just for an instant, when this burst source flashes, the, the luminosity of that, that burst, just in those five millisecond, outshines all the stars in its own galaxy by far, by you know, thousands, and also rivals the luminosity of an actual active galactic nucleus, which are formed um, from, the, from the power created by a supermassive black hole. So these are incredibly luminous, only for a very brief period of time, so really interesting objects. This is also a milestone that we've now achieved technologically. As Casey described, we had to come overcome a mass massive computational challenge to actually perform the fast imaging that we need to, to find this burst and localize it. Um, but on the broader stage, one of the reasons for more excitement is that this phenomenon is so well tuned to explore the universe. And it's incredibly rare that we find a phenomenon, in fact, so well tuned to explore the universe. In particular, not only to explore the material between stars, which is already empty space, but also between galaxies, which is an even more diffuse matter. Although there is material there, it's very difficult to see. Um, but what's fascinating about a fast radio burst, here I'm showing a fast radio burst sitting in its host galaxy, traveling through not only that host galaxy's material, also through the inter intergalactic medium, the space between galaxies, and then through our own interstellar medium, the space between stars before it arrives at Earth. Radio signals are a great way to explore these materials because they interact strongly with electrons in the plasma that's very diffuse but sitting in, in these regions. And what we're able to do with fast radio bursts is look at their dispersion and other properties that we can measure directly with radio telescopes and probe what would otherwise be invisible matter in these regions. And in this way, we can actually study the structure and the content of this empty space and locate uh, material that is not, not visible by other telescopes and not discoverable by other telescopes. Now, there were two key ingredients for this achievement. And I'm putting again here, I'm kind of channeling Casey and, um, and Sriharsh and actually putting our Gemini observation of this field within the Arecibo localization region. Now, Arecibo is fantastic because it was able to detect multiple bursts from this location and identify this region as an interesting source. But I, I imagine that many of you and perhaps all of you will be hard pressed to, to localize that fast radio burst within this region. Um, not even sure I could point it out in this field, and I'm, I'm pretty well versed at it. Um, but what the point is here that the, the host of this galaxy was so small and so faint that what the two things that were incredibly critical for this were both arc second localization, not general localization, and not even a factor of 10 better than Arecibo, but arc second localization, which pins this down to a specific spot in the sky. But then beyond that, actually doing deep sky imaging and coordinating with optical observatories to then understand what's in that location in the sky. This is exciting on a world stage because radio telescopes around the world are, are looking for fast radio bursts and have been for a number of years. Um, here I'm showing a map. You can find this map online. Uh, it's, it's interactive. You can click and see the telescopes. Um, the, the stars are the, the telescopes which have, have actually detected fast radio bursts. So the um, Very Large Array in New Mexico, uh, Green Bank Telescope in, in West Virginia, Arecibo, and, and Parks Observatory has been a prolific, uh, pr prolific discoverer of fast radio bursts. And we, we get a gold star because we, we localized one. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point is here that telescopes around the world are trying to seek fast radio bursts. And in fact, I would dare to say that every major radio astronomical observatory are chasing this phenomenon. But what we really are stressing with this detection and this localization is that there are three axes which are important for fast radio burst science. Um, originally, we were chasing things like sensitivity, you know, getting deeper in the sky to try to find more fast radio bursts. Also, the rate of fast radio bursts in a small area that the radio telescope can see is not very large. So we either need to cover a huge region of the sky or spend a lot of time observing the sky. But the critical axis that we've now added to this is localization. We're now able to achieve that, but what is 
what is also important to point out is that no telescope spans all of these three important aspects of fast radio burst detection and science. We need all three of these to contribute. Um, many telescopes span two, but none sit in the sweet spot of, of um, using all three. So many telescopes around the world will continue to contribute to this science, um, although some balance far more towards localization, some far, are far more towards observing a, a broad region of sky, and some are simply very sensitive, can find many, many more repeaters, for instance, if there are more. Um, the other aspect is coordinating with telescopes worldwide that are not radio observatories. Um, some of this coordination has gone on, and I think now that we have localized a fast radio burst, we're able to pinpoint the spot in the sky it came from, therefore follow this location up with other astronomical observatories and see what other types of emission are there. Is there something else that flares? Um, is there something else that um, explodes after the fast radio burst goes off? Is there any correlated emission? Um, and that brings me to my closing, which are, are simply open questions now in this field um, in the wake of this localization. First, unfortunately, we don't truly know what makes the source burst yet. Uh, we don't yet know what, what caused the fast radio burst source to exist, and we don't yet know the physical mechanism that makes such bright and intense pulses. We have seen a persistent radio source in this location, and in fact, that and the optical galaxy are the only multi-wavelength emission, despite many searches um, in other wave bands that exist at this location. And the co-location with a persistent radio source really implies either an evolutionary or perhaps a causal connection between these two. So for instance, if the persistent radio source represents an active galactic nucleus, perhaps the radio bursts are caused by some outflow from that, um, from that galactic nucleus coming from a jet interacting with galactic material. On the other hand, it might be something more familiar. This could be a very distant supernova remnant that we're seeing representing the persistent radio source, perhaps some kind of neutron star phenomenon uh, or a similar phenomenon, which is equally incredible because it is so intense that um, the, you know, the neutron stars in our galaxy never, never pulse this bright in the radio, or at least have not been observed to do so. We don't yet know if all fast radio bursts are the same, and all the talks have stressed this. We have really only localized this one fast radio burst. However, all fast radio bursts do have excessive dispersion. Um, this burst happens to lie in a very distant galaxy, what seems likely is that there will be other examples of fast radio bursts laying in distant galaxies. Um, and it remains to be seen if many more fast radio bursts repeat. This is as yet the only repeater. And if other fast radio bursts can be localized to distant galaxies as well. And I'd like to take the chance to thank uh, the NSF for funding a lot of this research and also a lot of the telescopes that were used for this discovery. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Very compelling. So we're going to throw it open to questions, uh, but before we do, I want to remind everybody that uh, this session is embargoed until 12 noon central time, 1 o'clock eastern time, when the latest issue of Nature uh, hits the electronic or the digital newsstand um, and uh, a paper by this group uh, will appear there and also a couple of papers in AppJ letters. So uh, please identify yourself uh, when you ask your question and let us know who you're asking your question of. We'll start down here with Alex. I'm Alex Witsey with Nature. My question is for, I think, Sri Harsh, unless Sarah also wants to weigh in. Can you talk a little bit more about ext other extreme events that happen in dwarf galaxies? You talked about these long duration gamma ray bursts, um, superluminous supernova. What? Uh, I mean if other FRBs are also localized in dwarf galaxies and there is a connection, it's unlikely that it's a random chance. Um, so one of the things which we understand a bit about long, long duration gamma ray bursts and superluminous supernovae is that they might be because formed due to really massive stars which are formed only in uh, low metallicity galaxies, which in the local universe are dwarf galaxies. Uh, and they, they seem to be forming highly magnetized stars, neutron stars, uh, when, when they undergo the supernova, and that might be related to the FRB, but we don't know yet. It's also maybe worth noting that um, gamma ray burst phenomena tend to be cataclysmic, whereas this burst repeats, and we can see that whatever is causing these continuous you know, 
continue over, is not a cataclysmic phenomenon because it happens over and over again. Um, so we don't know that there is no relation between gamma ray burst phenomena and this, this burst source, but what is causing the burst is not the same event. That's, that's it. Okay, more questions? Okay, we have one over here. Please remember to identify yourself. Uh, I'm Ashish Mahabal from Caltech. Have the spacings between the different bursts have been analyzed for this mm. source? Jason? Uh, yeah, so we, we have obviously looked to, to see if we can find periodicities in the burst arrival times. Uh, so far we have been unable to find any uh, obvious periodicity in the, the burst arrival times. That leads us to the conclusion that if the source is still periodic in some way, um, for instance if it's a rotating star, then the emission of the bursts would not be occurring at the same, let's call it rotational phase on, on the neutron star, for instance, if it's a neutron star. Uh, or there could be some other, you know, uh, epicycle, let's call it, like an orbit or something like that that's complicating the, the tr determination of, uh, of a period. But so far we have not been able to find any period, and that's quite unlike what we've seen in, in most neutron stars where you see individual radio bursts. It's, it's normally very easy to find a, a strict periodicity, and we don't see that here. Any other questions from the floor? We have one over here from Leslie. This is for Shami. Uh, we've, we've talked about this. The, um, the, the source size must be um, smaller than about 300 kilometers to be coherent, right? Right. And the energy density is something of order what you get from an AGN. Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> so this is, this is interesting. Uh, one of the assumptions in calculating and estimating that energy is that it's isotropically emitted. And one way to get around this is to invoke smaller and smaller beaming angles. Now, you can get some beaming by stacking up, let's say, lensing in the plasma, just like cusps in the reflection in your water glass. You can have a cusp, and every time the Earth is within that cusp, we see some of these bursts. Other times, we don't see it, and it requires a precise alignment of these lensing structures. For example, that could be one way to get around this. Now, we don't get this for free. Because if you're invoking beaming, that means that the rate of these things has to go up correspondingly. So we said five to 10,000 of these flashes going off all over the sky every day. Um, that rate has to be many times higher if you're going to say that this is beamed tightly so that it's only 1% of the sky. So it's not, a, it's not a free lunch there, but that's one possible way in which we could invoke we could get around this energy density issue. The other possibility is that, yeah, it's exotic physics and we're just you know, starting to see something interesting. Inga, do we have any questions on the webcast? Okay. Hello? Uh, yes, uh, the first question is from Leah Crane from New Scientist. The press releases all say it's over three billion light years away. The paper says 972 megaparsec, but the presenters keep saying 2.5 billion light years. How far <laughs> away exactly is the host galaxy? <laughs> if we were debating Please give it to the nearest light year. Nine, nine, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Yes, is, this is a, yes, this is an unfortunate issue. I will let Sri Harsh explain that. Yeah, Sri Harsh's <laughs> fault. So. It's Sri Harsh's fault, so he should. <laughs> okay, so uh, the answer to the question is, in the paper it says 972 megaparsec. That is the luminosity distance. Uh, that is the effective distance for for light to travel, and that uh, the, that's the way we calculate the luminosity of the host. And um, that is not exactly the same as the amount of time it took to travel, because the the light as the exp universe expands loses energy, and that's why the luminosity distance is larger than the uh, actual light travel distance. Yeah. We're, we're victims of our own success here. We've put this thing so far away that space is expanding and making it difficult to explain what's happening. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I think it's also important that we're all galactic <laughs> astronomers until very recently, so. Uh, I think it'd be safe just saying it's billions and billions of light years away. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Jan Hattenbach, a freelance from Germany. If anyone knew you would have possibly told us, but surely there are ideas on what could cause a repeated FRB 121102. Could you please say, uh, share some thoughts on that? Um, Sarah, maybe? Sarah. Sarah. Oh, sure. Um, so I did mention two possibilities, um, having causal relations between the persistent radio source and the, the burst source itself. 
Um, so there are ideas about how you could have an um, active galactic nucleus impacting, for instance, like bubbles of plasma in space, which then, um, for a brief period of time before they're destroyed by that, by that jet, they illuminate and they, they start to glow. Um, and for just a, a brief moment, they, they illuminate in, in radio waves um, and then, uh, then are gone. So this could happen multiple times because you know, the galaxy itself is a turbulent, is a turbulent medium. It will, um, it will be replenishing its, its bubbles over and over again. So that's one possibility. Um, I also mentioned the possibility of a neutron star phenomenon, possibly even something like a Bangdatar, which is a, just a very, very highly magnetic neutron star, um, which can be a little bit more extreme in its properties. You know, its magnetic fields are thousands of times higher than, um, than standard neutron stars. Um, and standard pulsars. And of course, they are a rotating phenomenon. We might expect them to be continually bursting if they are emitting jets. Thank you. And those are two theories that have been discussed for this verse lately. Okay. Thanks. The next question is from Keith Cooper of Astronomy Now from the UK. This FRB is the only one uh, seen to repeat. Beyond the repeated signals, is there any indication that it has a different origin to uh, the other one-off FRBs? Sure. Um, I'll take that one. Um, no, I think in a word the answer is that this, other than the fact that we have observed it to repeat, and I guess the other exception is that this is the only one that was detected with Arecibo so far. Um, other than these two exceptions, they look pretty similar to other examples of FRBs that have been observed. The pulses don't look that different. The pulse dispersion measure doesn't look that different. It's all, it puts it extragalactic. One other issue is that this was detected right in the galactic plane in the anti-center direction. So looking directly away from our gal galactic center, looking out, we are detecting this through the plane of our own galaxy from some distant source. And that may have something to do with how much it is scintillating up and down, and therefore why we can detect this one repeating versus other ones not repeating. Um, this is wading into somewhat messy modeling issues, but the simple answer is that no, the other one-off FRBs look just like this repeating FRB, and it might just be a question of time and observing before we can catch other repeaters as well. Thank you. If I could refine that a bit, I think one fun part of the story is that the repeater was in some sense sort of the weakest uh, FRB because of the fact that we saw it in the galactic plane and it was repeating. People thought maybe it's anomalous in some way and we shouldn't really uh, you know, weigh our hopes on the understanding of every phenomenon from this one example, but by placing this at a cosmological distance, we've elevated the whole population of FRBs. And so now what we used to be in some sense a weak candidate of FRB is, is, the, is the prototype and, and now it establishes how we're gonna go about understanding the whole population. Thank you. Um, can I just weigh in one more thing? Um, it's worth pointing out that uh, there's no explicit differences, um, uh, but there are explicit similarities between this, this the repeater and other fast radio bursts. Um, historically, when we were first discovering fast radio bursts, all of them were single events, single peaked even. Um, but then the repeater came along and it has several, you know, single events that are double peaked. Um, it has spectra that, that fall off at the edges of our, of our bands. And we've started to see now other bursts that have those properties too, so multiple peaks and uh, spectra that, that vary across the band. Um, so there are phenomenological similarities between individual repeater bursts and other fast radio bursts that we've seen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Jean-Paul Fritz, a freelance from France. If the FRB source is offset related to the galaxy's center, mm -hmm. does it rule out an active galactic nuclei as potential source? Um, that's maybe more for Sri Harsh okay. than for me. But. Mm. Uh, so, no, it doesn't really uh, rule out an active galactic nucleus for a source, but it is uh, because dwarf galaxies are often found to have AGN which are offset. Uh, but at the same time, I should mention that AGN are very rare in dwarf galaxies, and we do not see any optical signature of AGN activity. Uh, so, if you had AGN's, a AGN activity, the spectrum would have shown some signature and we do not see it. So, but it is also possible that that signature is somehow masked. So it is not clear yet, but the optical observations slightly prefer the supernova remnant idea, uh, but we cannot rule out the AGN. 
it, it's a slight preference because for yeah. irregular dwarf galaxies, there's a distinction between the center of light and the center of mass. They can be different things. Yeah. And so an AGN can't be ruled out yet. Okay, thank you. The next question is from uh, Jesse Emsbach, freelance from QZ.com. Can the frequencies the FRB uh, is at rule out any particular causes? What kind of frequency <laughs> are you referring to there? Like if it's radio frequency, then no, because it looks just like other FRBs. We detect this at one to two gigahertz. We've also detected it at two to four and all the way up to eight gigahertz now, this particular source has been detected. Yeah, but I think, uh, so I think the spectral properties of the bursts themselves are diagnostic. Yes. There's something there either due to, uh, you know, the intrinsic physics that creates the bursts or um, its propagation through interstellar space that, yes. uh, that uh, there's something to learn from the, yeah, the spectra of the bursts themselves and that's something that we're working quite hard on right now as well. So a second interpretation of frequency is the rate of occurrence of the bursts themselves, which has consequences for the, the energy that generates them. You know, presumably there's a source that produces the burst and has to sort of replenish itself before another burst is generated. So we haven't looked a lot into that, but there may be some, some physics we can do there to, to understand the process that generates the bursts. Thank you. Uh, there is a follow-up question from Jan Hattenbach uh, from Germany. Could LOFAR or SKA mm -hmm. be used to search for more FRBs? Or do they work at two different frequencies? I can cover this a little bit. Sure. Um, there have been a number of low-frequency antennae. So LOFAR operates at, I think, 150 megahertz um, or below. Um, SKA will operate, I believe, up to 1 gigahertz. Um, so this whole range is, um, I think, fair play for fast radio burst discovery. Uh, fast radio burst has been discovered down to 700 megahertz. However, there have been a number of searches at very low frequency with LOFAR and with uh, the Murchison Wide Field Array that have not detected any fast radio burst. This does put limits on their properties. So based on the, the physics that's going on in them, we might expect them to not be detected at low frequency, for instance. Um, it might also just have to do with the flat fact that the properties of the interactions in the materials between there and here actually make it very much more difficult to detect these things at very low frequency. So the lower you go, the more difficult it's intrinsically to detect. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Howard Skilling from the uh, Netherlands. Uh, can you uh, provide me with URLs of the two AppJ papers after the embargo expires? Uh, yeah. Rick can do that. Very good. Yeah. All right. And uh, the next question is, um, okay, they didn't give me the affiliation from Kate. Uh, can you say a little more about previous attempts to find FRB counterparts and other wavelengths and why those f fell short hmm. or were ambiguous? Uh, sorry, it's a Kate Becker freelance. Sarah, Hi, Kate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we know Kate. Um, maybe I can start in on this and then Sarah can take over. Um, the key, the key question here is the distinction between sensitivity and resolution. So with the high sensitivity of Arecibo, we can find these bursts. With the high sensitivity of single dish telescopes like Arecibo or Parks or the Green Bank Radio Telescope, we can find these bursts, but they don't have sufficient resolution on the sky as Casey showed in his plots or Sarah and Shriha showed. Within their localization regions, there's many, many, many possible candidate host galaxies, many candidate radio sources that could be associated with it. Um, with the VLA, instead of a 300 meter light bucket, we have 27 light buckets, which are 25 meters each. Um, so we don't have as much raw sensitivity. But what we can do with interferometry is synthesize a larger radio telescope. The diameter that we can synthesize is much larger, and therefore the resolution on the sky that we have is much higher. And that's how we can pin it down to a tenth of an arc second, and now, there's much less ambiguity about what source it could be associated with. And we've gone a step farther, as Jason showed, with the EVN and Arecibo, we now have even more precise localization, and there's no ambiguity whatsoever about the association between the fast radio burst, the persistent radio source, and the optical host galaxy. Okay, thank you. But I, think, I think, did I understand the question was about prior work attempting to find uh, counterparts? I, mm. I think there is a a well-published and cited result, which has mm. put, been put into doubt by our discovery, so it's worth commenting. Uh, but I think prior work has made the effort to 
uh, to do coordinated observing well and uh, follow-up observing to try and uh, constrain uh, specific models of how FRBs might occur. And so one model this prior work played on was thinking about gamma ray bursts and maybe FRBs of a radio burst and then some sort of slow evolving afterglow, kind of like a gamma ray burst might behave. And so I think what we're showing is that that's not the phenomenon we're talking about that we're seeing for this FRB. And so it, uh, and in fact, the radio bursts themselves are quite anomalous and occur in these very faint and uh, unremarkable environments. So I think, uh, I think that's part of the story of localization and millisecond imaging uh, uh, is that we need to do that and uh, to capture them as they occur, to do this uh, science we want to do. Thank you. And as Casey and Sarah have already said, we, we, sh we are being cautious to say for this FRB. Um, we think it is likely that these conclusions apply to all FRBs, but this is not something we know yet. And it could turn out that instead of one wonderful puzzle, nature has given us multiple wonderful puzzles to solve. Yeah, but yet for all FRBs, if we don't have localization for them, it will always be a statistics game to try to do multi-wavelength follow-up because we will always have a large number of galaxies within the field. And because we don't know what fast radio bursts are, we have an essentially infinite potential for something to occur in that field. And then we have the really difficult task of analyzing what's the probability of that something or anything else having occurred in that field. That's, that's the difficulty of it. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from uh, Daniel Fischer of the Cosmic Mirror in Germany. Uh, does nailing down the host for this FRB rehabilitate in any way the since questioned link of FRB 150418 to a galaxy? Yeah, um, and this is something that Leslie has asked me as well um, and Casey sort of alluded to. Um, I think that is an open question because I will point out that in the, so the, so the question here is that Keen et al. published a result of an FRB localization where they claimed a localization based on a so-called radio afterglow, which has since been shown by people, including some people here, um, to be just radio variability. It's not an afterglow, it's just a variable source. Now, the source that we are reporting today as the persistent counterpart to our FRB is also a variable source. But I will emphasize that in our field of view at the VLA, there were at least seven other sources with just as much variability, if not more variability. So variability alone is not an identifier of an FRB counterpart or host. I think that that is an important um, distinction to make. It may be that FRBs are associated with sources that are variable, but that does not mean that variability uniquely identifies the host of an FRB. So I would say it remains an open question and there's no real strong grounds to claim that association at this point. Okay. Thank you. The last question is from Sarah Kaplan from the Washington Post. Uh, obviously, there are still a lot of possible explanations for the cause of FRBs, but it seems like most folks are leaning towards some kind of emission from neutron stars. Is it fair to say that the favorite, ex is it fair to say that's the favorite explanation? Are there any other important candidate explanations that readers should definitely know about? Um, I think Sarah mentioned um, the AGN models as well, and there are good theoretical models that claim to be able to do the kind of emission phenomenon that we're seeing with AGNs, basically um, these relativistic jets vaporizing blobs of plasma and producing radio flashes. Um, we, pers we probably don't favor that, but at this point, I think that is moving a little bit into speculation. I think it is, it is probably right to say that our personal biases are towards neutron star interpretations, maybe, maybe, but um, that's, that's, that, is a, that is a personal bias that is not yet backed up by the evidence. The evidence just lets us claim that we can rule out cataclysmic models for this source we can rule out galactic models for this source. We can rule out nearby galaxy models for this source. Beyond that, let's see where the evidence takes us. I believe we're also all still in open to the possibility that there could be more than one mm. creator of fast radio bursts yes. in the universe, one physical creator. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, it's worth keeping in mind that there's a uh, you know, predecessor or a precedent to, to what we're seeing now because uh, gamma ray bursts were discovered in the 70s and we didn't really know what they were until we had known about 
thousands of them. And right now we've got less than two dozen of these. So we're really in the infancy, but uh, we're obviously ahead of making fast progress. <laughs> we're ahead of schedule. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Larry, did you? Was there a question in here? You have your own question. Okay. Yes, uh, Larry Marshall, Deputy Press Officer. Will the advent of a deeper, more sensitive, uh, uh, all-sky optical monitoring with the LST offer any possibilities for uh, further analysis of these, or is the cadence too slow on that? Do you, do you know? I think uh, the best thing about LSST is that it, I believe it covers a very large area of sky, hence the synoptic. Um, one of the issues we have with coordinating optical observatories and radio observatories to observe the same spot in the sky is that almost all observatories in the world are oversubscribed and optical, particularly big optical observatories are also, you know, multiply so. Um, and the fact that LSST can see a large area of sky, I think has a fantastic chance to just by chance have coordinated observations. Um, particularly for with, with wide area radio telescopes, we'll be able to see similar areas of sky and be able to statistically connect, you know, events from both from both telescopes. Right now, we have no expectation that these radio flashes yep. have corresponding optical flashes, but as Sarah says, we don't know that yet because of this difficulty in we having coordinated observations. But if we if we do find, say, in five years' time, where we can maybe. So we, at the moment, we have these threads that potentially connect magnetar birth and evolution to the generation of these, say, superluminous supernovae or, or uh, long gamma ray bursts, and then eventually evolving into these sort of fast radio burst uh, phenomena. And so if, that, if those threads kind of get borne out by the next few discoveries in this field, I think we'll find that optical uh, surveys will be a very powerful way of identifying future FRB locations, because they'll tell us where those magnetars are sitting out in the universe. I want to explain that Jason didn't get up and leave because he was fed up with the quality of the questions. Uh, he actually uh, uh, had to go give a talk in one of the oral sessions. Um, so any other questions here in the room? All right, well, the timing worked out perfectly then because we're just coming to the end of the hour. Um, so uh, I want to thank our speakers again. Thank you very much. And thanks to Nature and AppJ Letters and all of the institutions that participated in making this briefing possible today. Uh, our next briefing is at 2.15 Central Time this afternoon, continues the theme of radio astronomy. We'll be hearing about new science results from the Arecibo Radio Telescope. Again, the embargo on the results that you've heard today expires at 12 noon Central, and after that, you'll hear about it through the grapevine. <laughs>